Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. We have another short myths show for you. Stephen Fisher, whose Sword Beach book is getting closer and closer, is looking at the whole Juno Beach name saga. So I'll bring him in now. Good evening, Stephen. How are you? I'm very good, Paul. The evening. How are you? I'm good. Well, I remember this one from Twitter. I remember you going through it again, and it, it is interesting. And the, the key thing I think we talked about is you, you can't disprove a negative in this one. And yeah. some of these myth shows have been, it's complete bunkum. Others have been, well, there's some truth and some have been actually not a myth. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you to take us through it, basically, folks. And um, and uh, we can do questions at the end, but Stephen's going to present his case uh, of the Juno Beach naming saga. Yes, so I, I will try and keep this as brief as I can, um, but yeah, some hope. Let's see how I get on. Um, yeah, as you say, it's, it's very difficult to disprove a myth, and um, I'm trying to prove a negative, essentially, and when I have to do this, I always come back to, to this by the, the philosopher Russell Bertram and his Russell's teapot, as it's called, and the basic sort of story of this is Russell said you could claim that in space there is a teapot orbiting the sun, and it's too small to be seen with any appliance that we have here on Earth. Um, so you can't disprove it. So there's no way of saying, oh, well, there isn't a teapot circulating the sun um, because you can't actually prove that there isn't. What this is about, he was relating it to religion, but of course it works in every other sort of aspect as well. And essentially you can't prove a negative. It's impossible to prove something isn't the case really the onus is on the person making the claim yep. to burden of provide proof. that proof the burden of proof exactly i could say that juno beach was originally going to be called tim and nobody can disprove that because there is no document anywhere in all of the files at the national archives that says this beach was not going to be called tim such an example doesn't exist and it is the same with jelly essentially what i can do is show you all of the evidence that there was never the jelly doesn't appear in the historical record and instead other names and other sort of descriptions exist and so that is what i'm going to do but first we should briefly touch on where this story has come from the the whole jelly beach thing and the, the basic background of it is that essentially um originally the planners when they came up with the names of the beaches uh assigned juno beach the name jelly beach and this was part of this nautical theme or the fish theme, you have gold and sword, both of which can be fish, goldfish, swordfish, and so with J, they came up with jellyfish. Now, this has been shared quite widely on websites and in books. Um, the Juno Beach Centre have it as well, and they reference it back to this book, which is essentially D-Day for Dummies, which I, I don't think is really a, a high-quality source, and when you look in it, there's no source in it for this statement. But it does have the basics of the story, which is that, yes, originally... They were going to call the beach Jelly Beach for jellyfish. Churchill saw this and in his usual Churchillian way said, I will not send men to die on a beach called Jelly. And um, one of his assistants, uh, Wing Commander Michael Dornay, said um, we should call it Juno Beach after my wife. Now, supposedly Michael Dornay was Canadian. There is no Canadian that I can find called Michael Dornay, not a wing commander anyway, but there was a British wing commander michael dornay i haven't been able to find out where he was assigned what he did i know that he was technical branch of raf um, in communications but i don't know if he was assigned to anyone's staff in 1944. he did have a wife called julian um, that could be abbreviated to juno i suppose juno could be a nickname so there is potential that he did suggest the name juno what that doesn't prove though is that the there was ever any intention to call the beach jelly so this name could have come from michael dornay um we can't ask him he died in a shooting accident in austria in 1946 um so he has he's sort of been lost to history this is the only photo i've ever been able to find of him and his wife julian um but for somebody who supposedly came up with the name for juno beach there's remarkably little about him online nobody seems to have ever turned up any information about him um but yeah it He's apparently the origin of the Juno name. Now, I'm not so sure that this is actually the case, because if we go back through the historical record and we start with the allocation of the beaches in 1943 and the Cossack plan submitted um, by uh, Frederick Morgan, um, the original beach allocations are spelled out here in the, the original plan or appreciation of Operation Overlord. And you can see the three beaches that are chosen 
for the landings. There's 313 Beach, 308 Beach, and 307 Beach. And I've laid this out a bit more clearly here. Um, these then correspond with Omaha, Gold, and Juno Beaches later on. Why are they numbered 307, 308, and then a gap to 313? I'm fairly certain that this is based on topographical surveys that were conducted during the war, because in a 1946 document, um, we have this allocation of beaches, which is exactly the same, just with different code numbers. But you can see between Gold and Omaha, there are these four other potential landing areas. Um, so we go from B45 to B46 Beach, but there's four landing zones in between. And if we go back to this, that would account for the missing four numbers between 308 and 313. So 309, 310, 311, and 312 are those other four landing zones. So I'm pretty sure that these numbers are just based on the topographical surveys that were being conducted through the war. There's not much else to them then. Of course, Cossack's plan is put forward, it's approved, but nothing really happens for six months. But what does happen um, is almost certainly that the sectors are allocated to the landing areas. So we have all of these individual sectors, Abel, Baker, Charlie, Dog, Fox, Juno, uh, sorry, not Juno, Jig, uh, Queen, that sort of thing. Now, this was probably done in advance of 1944 because this is standard combined operations procedure to allocate sectors. And what I think probably happened is that they allocated the area between Isini Samir and Wistrom allocations first, because it starts able at Isigny Samer and finishes at uh, Roger at Wistrom. Then later on, we have these further code names applied to what would become Utah and Band Beaches. So I think they were probably added later because they're not in sequence. And that would be explained by just concentrating on the middle bit first. But of course, as we know, um, Montgomery and Eisenhower are both brought on board. Montgomery then expands the plan and Eisenhower approves it when he returns from the States on the 21st of January. And what happens just after that is the first overlord outline plan is issued on the 1st of February 1944. And within that plan, the landing area is divided into three separate sectors, X, Y and Z. And these are actually given fuller code names, X-ray, Yoke and Zebra. This is the only allocation, but what is spelled out is all of those individual landing zones, um, Peter, Queen, Roger, that sort of thing. So they are now formalized. They're, they're in the record. X-ray, Yoke and Zebra are then further named in free zones. So East Cottentin area, Khan area and South Sen area. But interestingly, beyond that, there's a lot more detail in this, this first iteration of the plan on the actual um, division, if you like. So the Americans are going to be landing in the west. That's allocated the first U.S. Army area, second British Army area on the, the east side. And the, the divisional, oh, sorry, the, the army group line is straight down the middle, starting at Port on Bessin. Um, the specific landing areas are also laid out with grid references and names. So over at Utah, we have the Madeline area, and the Viaville Colville area, which of course is going to become Omaha Beach. Western Assault area is essentially Gold and Juno beaches, and the Eastern Assault area is going to become Sword. So those landing areas have already been picked right at the very start of the planning after Montgomery and Eisenhower come aboard. The other thing that is also established in the, the first iteration of the plan, again dated 1st of February 1944, is the naval task forces. Now, crucially, they're split into two. Underlined in yellow there, we have Naval Commander Western Task Force, and then blue, Naval Commander Eastern Task Force. Um, so the division of those two task forces is already being established, and I think it's reasonable to assume that it will follow the same boundary that is later spelled out, and of course, ties in with the, the land boundary between 1st US Army area and 2nd British Army area. What's most important, though, is these task forces. They've already been assigned in the 1st of February. So we have Force U and Force O for the American beaches and Forces G, J and S for the British beaches. When I say British, I'm just referring to the British area. I know the Canadians were there as well. No slight is intended upon the Canadians. I'm just simplifying um, so those task forces exist. Now, the, the two new ones are Force U and Force G. And in the same document, you'll notice it says 
Uh, the names of the two new forces, G and U, are only provisional and will probably be changed. Now, as it turns out, they weren't. But that just gives you an idea of, of how meaningless these letters essentially are. Force mm. A was actually formed in 1943. Force J was formed in 1942 for Operation Jubilee um, and had existed purely as a skeleton staff throughout the rest of 1942 and through 1943. They are just code letters that the Royal Navy assigns to various task forces in the same breath as, as Force H down at Gibraltar, Force Z over in the Far East. Uh, it's just their standard way of assigning task force identities. They, they have no specific meaning but they do exist on the 1st of February, 1944. So these three areas um, can be divvied up quite significantly into the, these various landing areas. But then, of course, the, the outline overlord plan starts to get its various amendments. The first amendment is issued on the 2nd of March, 1944, so just over a month later, and they start dividing the areas more clearly. So, uh, the central Khan area is split into two, and we have Omaha and Jem. The Sen area over to the far east is called Band, and the East Codington area is given the name Utah. So already in the Western Task Force area, in the US area, we have Utah and Omaha assigned. So they've been assigned separately to the British beaches. Now, how that came about, there's lots of stories. A carpenter might have given the inspiration to uh, one of the US generals. It's possible. Again, that's very hard to disprove. Um, but they're American names. And I think it's fair to say that the Americans picked them. I'm not going to go into how that might happen. That's not today's talk. Um, but you can see the British sector is divided into gem and band. And basically, all three landings, what would become Juno, Gold and Sword, are all going to happen in gem area until the next amendment comes out on the 13th of April, 1944. And now we have the division of gem area into gold, Juno and sword. Um, but everything else is, is pretty much unchanged in that the Western task force and Eastern task force zones remain the same. The US army area and the second British army area remain the same. And even in these orders documents, they still refer to the Madeline area, the Viaville, Colleville area, Western Assault area, and the Eastern Assault area. Now, of course, those names are going to die out eventually, and those landing areas will become better known by the names Gold, Juno, and Sword, and, and so forth. But those are actually the names of the landing areas. And of course, it's always worth remembering at this point that there is no such thing as Gold Beach or Sword Beach. These are areas. Yeah. And then how Item, Jig, uh, Queen, their sectors, and the beaches are red and green bits of each of those sectors. So queen red is a beach, queen is a sector, and sword is just the area. So that gives us a period between the, the second, sorry, the first amendment at the 2nd of March and the next amendment on the 13th of April of six weeks when the name Juno came about. And of course, Everyone goes back to this guy being the person who comes up with this name change. But it's worth remembering that Churchill sits at the very highest level of the planning. He's the person who is receiving these amended documents. He's not in the process of making those amendments. He's the one being sent the final version. So he never received an amended version that called a beach jelly because it that, that amendment doesn't exist. It's not in... The, the list of amendments. The first amendment is the 2nd of March, the next amendment is April. So there's no in-between amendment that called these beaches jelly. In theory, it's possible that he might have gone to a, a planning office and looked over somebody's shoulder and somebody's written the name jelly for a beach, but I mean, that seems very unlikely. Um, and there's, there's no record of that ever happening least of all by Churchill himself. He never mentions this in any of his memoirs, in any of his talks, in his, his whole history of the Second World War. So where that comes from, I, I don't really know. But, I mean, it's, it's possible, of course, that there is this fish theme, and it's worth looking at the other maritime areas, especially in the British sector, because we also have pike, honey, scallops, the trout line. Band is a fish as well, band fish. So there is definitely this fish theme. And I know people are going to say, ah, oh, but Steve, what about the, the fish? And yeah, 
True, I can't deny that there is definitely a fish theme, but given everyone knows Churchill's um, vitriol for, for poor sounding names, and he even issued a memo in 1943 about making sure that names are of suitable character for operations that are going to take place. And he actually said, you know, there is an unlimited number of well-sounding names which do not suggest the character of an operation or disparage it in any way and do not enable some widow or mother to say that her son was killed in an operation called Bunny Hug or Ballyhoo. Um, proper names are good in this field. The heroes of antiquity, figures from Greek and Roman mythology, racehorses, etc. Now, given he issued this in 1943, it was a, a memo given to Pug Ismay and would have made its way into the planning teams and you know, especially the people who were tasked with issuing code words. Why on earth would anyone have selected the name Jelly at any stage in this operation? And even if you did decide we need to keep a fish theme, why would you pick Jelly? I would say, why wouldn't you pick this particular thing? And this is, I can't pronounce this, but I'll, I'll have a go. Colonicius australis, better known as the javelin fish. Isn't mm. that a much better sounding name? Javelin fish, javelin, that would be the perfect sort of, you know, name to choose if you have to stick to that fish theme. Even then, I'm not so sure that they needed to stick to the fish theme. And... Churchill said it himself in 1943, proper names are good here and figures from antiquity, figures from Greek and Roman mythology. And that's exactly what Juno is. Juno is this Roman goddess, considered to have been quite a warlike goddess um, in most accounts. She was the goddess of love and marriage and the protector of marriage. Now, if we really want to say, oh, but the fish theme, you know, we can link it to fish theme. I can link Juno's status as a god to the various roles that Juno had in the D-Day operation just as easily, as, as easily as somebody can say, oh, but jelly and fish. If she was the goddess of marriage and the protector of marriage, in a way, you could say, oh, but Juno's role was to marry together gold and sword beaches. And as um, Mark Milner did in his book and pointed out the significance of the landing on Juno Beach and the third Canadian division's role was to protect the, the central part of the, the landing area on the British side from armored counterattacks. So in that sense, Juno is protecting the marriage of sword and gold beaches. It's very easy to quickly just come up with these other ways in which you can link the significance of Juno to the, the landings as much as you can link the significance of jelly to the whole fish thing. Mm. But even more than that, um, Juno had four siblings, sorry, five siblings. She married one, obviously, Jupiter, who she sat with here. Uh, another two, this is um, Ceres and Vesta. Um, they're, they're not important. But the other two, her other two siblings, on the left, we have Pluto. And on the right, we have Neptune. Mm. Isn't that interesting, don't you think? You know, there's a bit of a connection there. I'd say that's a stronger connection than Jelly and this whole fish theme over on the eastern side of the, the beaches. So I think, um, really, in the absence of any evidence for Jelly and the fact that all of the books that publicise this fail to provide any comprehensive reference, I've searched everywhere I can think of for something that would give us this piece of evidence that Jelly was at any time considered, and I cannot find it. There is nothing in the historical records proper primary source documents or memoirs or anything like that to say that jelly was ever a consideration and returning to russell's teapot i really think now we have to switch our thinking and the burden of proof has to be on the people who make the claim rather than yeah. us going to chase our tails around saying that there's no evidence and that is my presentation <laughs> Well, that's fab, Stephen. And I knew I knew about the documentation, but the fact you got mythology in because, you know, golden fleece, there's swords in all sorts of mythology. Mm -hmm. Humans are very good at seeing patterns. That's we're good at thinking. You know, that's why we, you know, there's the, the designer idea about the universe. We look at the nature of what well, that has to have been designed. We're good at looking at formulas. And 
And the fish one has been in my head because that obviously got put in my head at my first reading about D-Day, whatever the hell that was. But actually, now you think about it, there's as many connections to mythology and probably exactly if yeah. you want to go a different direction, there's other directions you could take it to. Um, yeah, yeah. It, I, I think it's incredibly easy to, to make these connections in any way that you like. And obviously the American ones, Omaha and Utah, people have made connections completely ill-founded connections you know the, the attacking generals came from those states and that sort of thing because it's easy to imagine but harder to prove and i think what often happens with these these myths is that people make these connections in their head and then at some point in the past in the last 80 years somebody has said oh you know there's there's all of these fish things goldfish swordfish i wonder if at any point juno was going to be a fish as well and then somebody says, oh, yeah, I suppose they could have called it jellyfish. And this is a conversation in a pub. And then it spreads. Somebody says it to somebody else. And then it, it made a lighthearted comment in somebody's presentation. And then it just grows and grows and grows over time. And I, I wonder if that's the case here in, in some way, that somebody in the past suggested, oh, it might have been the case that. And then that turns into a, a fact that is always presented without any reference. No, definitely. And I think, it, you know, it's... Um, it's easy to see things that aren't there. And I think David O'Keefe makes the very good point that um, I'm not sure they put uh, a lot of thinking into them. I think it was more to avoid embarrassment, mm. blah, 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 blah. And for some reason, we we identify Normandy by the code names of the sectors, but we don't do that with Iwo Jima. We don't do that. Anzio, do we Do we think about Anzio as shingle or do we think about it as Anzio? Or Salerno, we say Salerno, don't we? So yeah. for some reason historians the community veterans have put a lot of stock in these code names that were just set up because they had to give it a name yeah and now they have meaning beyond what they meant back then yeah like and the most said, important thing is that the task forces existed first you yeah had force o force u force g force s and force uh, j the code words were drawn from those letters that is beyond any doubt so like you say um there's a certain amount of them just coming up with almost random names to a certain yeah. extent. They have no special significance other than that they needed a sector that corresponded with the task force that was assigned to it. Yeah. So the idea that they, they're putting critically important names or of a certain theme out in, in that way is, is, I think, a bit wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that there are probably more geared towards what Churchill wanted um, because he'd issued this memo in 1943. He was quite vocal on the significance of these names having some level of appropriateness. And we know that, for instance, he, he referenced racehorses and all of these operations in Normandy in the following months are named after race courses, yep. Goodwood and, and everything. So th they're listening to him. And I can't imagine for one minute, given that these names would have to pass through the, the code names branch anyway, how on earth could it have got to the stage that somebody might have suggested jelly when the very people who are tasked to do this have already been rocketed by Churchill in the past and saying, make sure you don't put any stupid names forward. How is jelly going to fit through that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, and the exceptions are always fun. I mean, again, the race courses, except when you get to blue coat. I mean, what does, yes. so I mean, how does that come in there? I mean, you can, you can look for patterns and then you can find exceptions to patterns. Mm. But, I want to, before we, we will leave this one nice and short, but Darren is just saying, are these maps in your book, Stephen, or can they be viewed somewhere elsewhere in one place? Obviously, the Sword Beach book is focused on Sword Beach, but where, are they going to be in your book? Uh, not the maps I've just used in this this, this talk, no, I'm afraid. They're, they're not really part of the, the Sword Beach narrative. Um, there are plenty of maps, plenty of maps in that book. I've just finished doing them. Some of them look great, and the, the design department at Transworld, they're doing an amazing, amazing job, and I'm currently reading through the copy editor's work he has done a fantastic job of Super deleting cool. all of the extraneous commas i've put in and all of the repeated words so it's it's looking fab i'm really cool excited. and Marin walters is adding a comment rather than a question i've got some more background on this steve did some digging in april 1944 overlord was a young horse running at stockton pulled out in the racing post which uh, winston churchill took religiously <laughs> so there's an overlord little connection there so you yeah. know um it, we're, we're back to this idea that we, we will bring doing things then that there are there are these exceptions i mean i i've always mm -hmm. wondered to myself why are the exits on exits on omaha beach d1 d3 e1 e3 f1 but the exits on the other beaches are one two three four five you know what mm -hmm. why why would there not be a consistent system across the five beaches but 
I think sometimes the answer is because no one really cared anybody didn't think that 80 years down the line people would go why did they it was just an arbitrary decision by someone who it didn't really matter what matters is making sure that operation overlord worked and that yeah. there's a foot, foothold in Europe we, exactly what bits were called and how they were named was irrelevant almost by the midnight on June the 6th 1944 wasn't it yeah, yeah, it was, it was irrelevant. And if you look through the planning documents of a large number of Force J, Force S, they don't refer to Sword or or Juno. They they refer to Queen and yeah. Nan and Mike Beaches. Those are the important things. The area is is of far less relevance, and you're you're hard pressed to find the name Sword, Juno, and Gold. I mean, they do appear, but not much. Yeah, and I found people just get very confused when I say, "Well, actually, Omaha Beach wasn't a thing." We, that's a la that's mm. a label we've given it in Sword Beach, yes. as you said. They were areas. People just look at you like, "No, no, I want it to be Sword Beach." Okay, it's just call it Sword Beach because we've accepted that is yeah. that's okay. Your book I, includes Sword Beach in the cover. That, that's, yeah, yeah. I I, I decided I, early on I I just have to roll with it, and you know it's common language now, like you say. And I make the point early in the book: there is no Sword Beach, but I will continue to refer to it continue to refer to that well we will leave it that Stephen. it's always great talking to you you'll have to come back on in june and when the sword beach stuff is further down the road and tell us about the project and and how you riddled it down to uh the, the book it is and, and how difficult it was handing over that manuscript because i know it's been an absolute labor of love it's a it's a cliche mm -hmm. but you know we've seen your progress on twitter twitter it has been an incredible process yeah, but come back and talk about that yes absolutely yes and folks that's it we'll see you in we'll see you again this uh, this week more things coming your way but thank you Stephen. thanks everybody for your questions it's paul Vodad for world war ii tv saying enjoy the rest of your monday cheers everybody bye well.